excited to introduce you to my co-moderator for today. It is Julie Morrison. She's the assessment director at Glendale Community College. We are both members of the Solve Professional Development and Learning Committee. And on behalf of the committee, we want to thank you for participating in today's structured conversation. Um, as you know, uh, Sal and our committee are committed to involving, featuring, and representing diverse perspectives and identities in our professional development offerings to meet your professional development needs. Uh, please feel far free to participate in today's discussion by asking questions, sharing your comments and ideas. We'd also like you to introduce yourselves um, so that we know who you are and where you're coming from. Um, and we also wanted to start this semester off with somewhat of an inspiring and awesome conversation about the important roles of student affairs assessment. It's a great time of uncertainty on many campuses due to enrollment challenges, budget reductions, as well as the political climate that many of our states are facing. So we wanted to bring you some very special guests to kick off the new academic year, highlighting how student affairs is serving as the foundation of many national conversations when it comes to post-secondary value, um, as well as student success and educational achievement. We also want to make sure that you know why associations and organizations are strategically including student affairs assessment um, as we talk and on the national level about uh, student success and to document the impact of higher education on students' lives. We also want to talk about when it's, in, when it's important to use strategic storytelling at the national level, and it does require student affairs assessment to be at the table and in those conversations. We also have two amazing uh, student affairs professionals who evolved into different levels of their careers and excited to share with you their experiences and how that plays out. Now, Julie. before we jump into hearing um, all about our presenters and then hearing from our presenters, I think you might have missed it as Mary Jo was going through those instructions, but what we would like you to do is make sure you set the chat to everyone, put your name, your role, and your institution into the chat. Uh, Gavin is setting us sending us off right, right there, just so we can get a sense. And what our presenters will be doing is as I'm introducing them, them since they obviously know about themselves already, uh, they'll be going through that chat and getting a feel for who is in the room and to keep that in mind as they are doing that presentation. We also have people besides Mary Jo and myself behind the scenes uh, supporting this. So if you have any problems, you are welcome to message you know, the hosts, the panelists, and we also encourage you to put questions into the chat because we will have time to ask questions, your questions of our presenters after our initial part. All right, and with that, I am very excited to welcome our two panelists. First, I'm going to introduce Amber Garrison Duncan. She is the Executive Vice, Presidency, Vice President of Competency-Based Education Network, um, also known as CBEN. Uh, she's led work in competency-based education, learning frameworks, assessment, credential recognition, digital learner records, and open data standards, as well as quality assurance. And obviously, we're moving into a lot of these things in our kind of uh, future in this role. Um, before her role at CBEN, Amber spent eight years as a grant maker at the Lumina Foundation, and prior to that, she served as Director of Student Affairs Assessment and Research at the University of Oregon and as a member of student affairs assessment leaders. She's also been in various student affairs roles at Florida State University, University of Michigan, Hope College, and Texas A&M. All right, our second panelist with us today is Leticia Maldonado. She serves as the program manager for post-secondary value with the Association of American State Colleges and Universities. She's got over 15 years of experience in higher education in the US and abroad. She joined AASCU, after her tenure as Dean of Students in California, and she has lived in Florence, Italy, where she had the joy and the unique experience of working with students, staff, and faculty from over 100 nations. Probably no one else on the call who can say that. Certainly not me. Um, all right. And if everyone can make sure to uh, mute themselves as they're coming in, that would be great. Now, Leticia has led student affairs teams at international institutions, private liberal arts colleges, Research One universities, and most recently in the California Community Colleges, Go Community Colleges. So thank you, Amber and Leticia, for joining us today. We are very excited to have you 
on the first of this new academic year's structured conversation. I would like to open up with having you share a little bit about yourselves and the role assessment has played in your career. So here is the very first opening prompt. Can you share a, an interesting memory of student affairs assessment that you experienced while working on campus? And let's start uh, with uh, Leticia, because I see you on my screen first, and then we'll throw it to Amber. Okay. Well, first of all, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. And so great to see so many faces. Um, and I think I could think of so many stories with regards to assessment, but I think probably one that pops up and why one of the reasons why I'm so uh, enthusiastic and energized around assessment work, particularly in student affairs, is, you know, very early on in my career in student affairs, I think it was my very first full-time role, uh, and I was seeing, um, overseeing activities, and we built such an, such an incredible orientation program for our students. We were very deliberate about ensuring that our orientation program had student learning outcomes, that, you um, it was, you know, that, that we really covered our bases in terms of making sure all students felt represented. I mean, we put so much time into our orientation program and very, we were very uh, deliberate in what we wanted students to, to, to walk away with. And um, I remember so clearly that when we uh, had our debrief about our event, which we were so excited about, uh, we felt like we just knocked it out of the park. Um, I remember my my supervisor at the time had asked me, um, you know, if if she could see the the assessments that we had done regarding our program, and I remember thinking, oh my god, we didn't do any, like we did not, we did not capture any of that, and. Um, Anyway, it was, now it's kind of funny when you think about it. I'm like, how can we not have captured it? But at that moment, I thought, oh my God, it did, it had not even occurred to me. I was a younger professional and I realized it wasn't something that we had talked about and we missed so many, such a critical opportunity to really capture the value of this particular program and the importance of this particular program to getting students off to the right, on the right foot and the right start. And so I just remember, I was so embarrassed that I, it had not occurred to me. We had a long conversation about it and I made it, you know, one of my priorities to ensure that assessment was going to be something that I did moving forward every single time. <laughs> and so now, you know, moving, you know, fast forward, it's something that I absolutely believe in. It's been part of my career, you know, for the last 15 years. It's something that my staff know that I'm, I'm really big on. And so I'm more than happy to share about my learning experience and how I decided I would never do that again. Big missed opportunity. That's fabulous. And I'm sure many of our uh, audience members can relate. Perfect example, I think, of where, you know, how we are always in a continuous improvement loop ourselves, right? All right, Amber, let's throw it to you and hear what you have to say. Well, I will uh, say good afternoon, good morning to all of you. Um, Leticia, as you were talking, actually, my head went back because now I'm realizing how long it's been since I left the University of Oregon. But um, when I think about the memory of, of this is just how many missed opportunities. I just remember when we were um, starting because I, I founded the department, um, there were so much thing, so many things we did not know. And, it, you know, for me, I'm like, how do we know that? How do we know this is working? How do we... And so I was asking those questions, even just about basic retention um, questions, right? And so, or persist, retention can persistence and completion data, or really being able to use that, that this, to see where the field is now, is really, um, it warms my heart and my soul to know that, because again, we, it means we're doing our jobs better in serving learners. And so, um, but again, that interesting, I just remember so many times being like, how do we not know, like, some of this basic pieces of information. And I would say too, disaggregated. Like I was the person who was like, okay, great. We have a 93% first year retention rate. 
But look at this. When we break this down, the Latino women on this campus are not retained at that amount or being able to, again, really examine that and, and then take that data and have some kind of cross campus conversation. Um, at the moment, it was still very kind of pockets and student affairs was like, we do this. And academic affairs was like, we do this and never would we cross, you know, it was like, we were not on the same team. And so I, a lot of those early conversations where again, we were increasing our curiosity and our commitment to learners, but then also just trying to find student affairs assessments role in the institutional context and culture and, and its, its purpose. And so looking back, those, those are coming out of the woodworks of like, oh, that was interesting times. But again, there's been a lot of good progress and people involved um, for a while now. Yeah, Gavin, I'm with you. I'm noticing Gavin's comment in the chat about how far things have come in 25 years. I remember being a TRIO director and thinking about that. And so both of you talked about what we used to not do versus compared to what we do now. And so I really, I, you know, especially when we think about student success and the value of post-secondary educational attainment, these are national conversations that are happening, right? And I have heard you both use in a variety of capacities the word strategic, intentional, and impactful when discussing student affairs assessment and the need to share our assessment information and tell our stories in student affairs more effectively. So uh, with your national organization and association hats on, can you share uh, what is being talked about in relationship to assessment um, and the student affairs um, role in producing that assessment? So let's go ahead, Amber, start with you and then we'll jump over to Leticia. Sure, um, I will just share kind of, uh, I will probably take more of a learning perspective on this just because of what I do day to day and thinking about the role of learning. Um, and so for context too, is that in a competency based education program, learners progress in their programs based on uh, the development of, of competencies at the program level. So they can uh, move through the curriculum at a pace that works for them and a flexibility that works for them. So everything that we do leans on assessment, because if we aren't assessing that learning and showing that, then the learner can't progress. So assessment is now just a part of a day-to-day -day conversation um, in my world and, and with the institutions that we're working with. And the reason I, I bring that up is that um, we are also part of, I think, what is a growing movement. And uh, Leticia is going to talk about kind of the value of higher ed, right? There's so many questions right now about the value of learning beyond high school. And I'm going to say that broadly because Learning happens a lot of different places. Um, and but people really questioning, what am I doing this for? Why? What am I, what's out of the return of this? And for so long, I think too, a lot of us assuming that um that this education was a great equalizer. And what we're you know uncovering, and certainly over the last uh five years, is that when you again start to tear that data apart, you start looking at it, that's not true for the vast majority. In this, in the context of where we all work in the U.S., absolutely not, not true here. And so again, it's bringing this question of value forward. Um, and so what we talk a lot about is value by by way of what am I learning? What am I going to be able to do with that? How does that help me advance my personal goals or maybe my employment goals? And making sure that that learning is aligned with something that is relevant, that I do have an economic return and that I do have mobility. Um, but also thinking about how I learn and that that experience should return agency to me. Um, something we used to talk about was like, oh, great, we got everybody to completion, but we beat the heck out of them. And this was not a good experience for a lot of low income individuals of color who had terrible experiences. And so understanding how, um, which often, if you if you think about learning theory, means that they weren't even that if I'm having a terrible learning experience, then my learning is not as deep as it should have been. And I wasn't served and I didn't get as much out of my education. So those are the, um, I think what's framing this, there is a huge movement around outcomes-based quality assurance. So I think you will see more of that. Um, there's been experiments with new types of accreditors, accreditors doing different types of, of that, but we're seeing across professional accreditors. So for instance, in nursing and teacher ed, that there are defined competencies for programs, again, that these are intended to deliver outcomes for individuals. But we're seeing that with national accreditors, uh, with, um, again, uh, there's new accreditors emerging, I would just say, keep an eye on this, because you're going to start to feel more of that pressure to say not just, 
did we have all this inputs and we did these beautiful things to construct a learning opportunity, but what did it actually produce and for whom? And we are going to have to be able to talk about, about that in meaningful ways. And so I think critically, um, student affairs plays a role. We see that in CBE programs where we talk about, again, what are the, how do I know deeply enough about my learners? Because the beauty of what we get to do is we get to provide differentiated learning experiences that meet their needs. And again, we want to make sure that everyone gets to mastery. We're not about performance sorting. Our job is to get everyone to that end goal. And I think that that is going to be the expectations that are starting to be placed on, on institutions and the critical role of assessment in that. Thank you, Amber. I, um, I'm happy to build on what Amber just said, and, and I really appreciate the context that you provided um, with respect to the really the question of what is the value of a college education and what are what is the return on investment for students. So I want to give you a little bit of context about my role in the work that we're doing um, at ASCU. And it's the American Association for State Colleges and Universities. And um, really my work stems from really the, the, the post-secondary valley commission work that started with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So I wanna to talk to you a little bit about that and bring you up to date in terms of what are the national conversations and how is ASCU really amplifying the work of the commission and engaging folks in, in these conversations about value. Um, so it was in April of 2019 that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation launched the Post-Secondary Value Commission um, and they did it with the Institute for Higher Education Policy, so I have, And it was really, you know, you know what, what the commission was really trying to tackle is this question and this narrative um, that that you know seems to be spreading that you know you don't really need a college degree it's not that important right and um, and so I think the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation you know acknowledged that this this is something that we want to really tackle we want to figure this out because uh, we know that the value of a college degree is huge and particularly for students who are underrepresented or students who are first gen. And so really countering that narrative is gonna be really important. Um, and so the commission, the main charge of the commission was to explore ways to define and measure what equitable post-secondary value is and really build momentum toward an actionable charge that could really, again, share the story of the value of, of an education. Um, now, the three things that the commission really did is offer three tools to identify, to measure and address inequities in access, completion and post-college outcomes. And the first thing is by providing a definition for post-secondary value. And that definition is that, that the commission came up with is equitable access and support to complete quality, affordable credentials that offer economic mobility uh, and prepare students to advance racial and economic justice in our society. So that's a definition that the commission provided. In addition to a post-secondary value framework, which outlines economic, but also non-economic benefits of a college degree. And lastly, an action agenda, which outlines, and this is really important, outlines policies and procedures that institutional leaders and federal policy state, excuse me, federal and state policy makers can implement to address systemic barriers that prevent underrepresented students from really reaping equitable returns from post-secondary education and, and achieving their um, economic and social mobility. Because as Amber mentioned, the returns, once you look at the data, you, you see that it's not equitably distributed, right? And so really building an, an action agenda for institutions and leaders and policymakers to follow that can support um, increase the post-secondary value, particularly for, for students of underrepresented backgrounds, low income and first generation students. Um, now the core principles of what the commission did um, are that one, equity matters, two, that institutions and programs matter, uh, that policy matters, um, that public returns and investment matter, and number five, which is what I wanted to talk about today, um, or elaborate on today is that measuring value matters. And so that's where the assessment piece comes in that I think is really important. Um, the five action items that the commission 
put out for all institutional leaders to consider are the following. And again, it, it comes back to assessment. And the first one is, this is how institutions could really increase post-secondary value for students. One is equalizing access to increase post-secondary value. Two is removing affordability uh, as an impediment to post-secondary value. Three is eliminate completion gaps and strengthen post-college outcomes to ensure post-secondary value. Four is improve data to expose and address inequitable post-secondary value. And three is, and five is promote social justice by providing equitable post-secondary value. So why am I sharing this with you today? Because one of the, one of the key elements of the work that the commission did and that now ask you, because the, the, the commission's work concluded, um, but uh, ask you has really taken a lead in amplifying the work of the commission because we really believe in it and uh, because um, we've been partners in this work. And um, really at the forefront of all of this has been assessment. So one of the roles that I have, one of the most important things that I get to do that I'm really excited about is to really work with our member institutions across the nation to really talk about how they are strategically assessing their programs in order to demonstrate the value, not only of the programs, but also the value of a post-secondary education for students and also supporting them and building those value propositions so that they can speak to students, they could speak to community members, and they could speak to, uh, to policymakers about the value that students are getting from their institutions. But assessment is really, really key, right? As I mentioned earlier, you know, early on in my career, it hadn't even occurred to me to assess, but it's so critical. Um, and as Mary Jo mentioned, particularly in the context that we're in right now in higher education with having to do less, um, having to do more with less, um, being under quite a bit of scrutiny uh, as, as higher education uh, leaders and higher education professionals and, um, and that narrative that has been gaining traction around the value of a college degree, it's particularly important now more than ever that uh, we are assessing programs and that we are supporting member institutions, ensure that they are you know, really applying very strategic and intentional assessment in order to really demonstrate value. Um, so that, that is a little bit about what we're doing. That's uh, you know a little bit about uh, what I'm doing with an ask you. And I am very passionate, very, very passionate because I about this work because I believe in the value of assessment of data collection and evaluation in order to, again, demonstrate the value of our programs, but particularly in student affairs, where oftentimes there's a misconception that, you know, our, our student affairs programs are not necessarily leading the way in student success and they absolutely are and I think it's just really critical that we support higher education uh, professionals, uh, program directors, program coordinators, and even executive leaders in, um, in really uh, building that culture of assessment and, uh, and that capacity to, to really speak about, about the results um, of their promising practices and outcomes. Leticia, yeah. I just, yeah, go ahead, Amber, jump in. What I, I just love this framing and um, and so appreciative of, of ASCII's leadership around this, especially as it's it moved from commission to what do we do, right? Because this has been a conversation, right? Um, and I just wanted to offer something that, um, that we've seen that I want to share with you because I think we can find a lot of ways to start to lift up practices that start to change. I know you all are seeing this, but one of the things that we're starting to see is from a student affairs perspective and that assessment perspective is the role of the career center and the career advisor in sitting in the gap between earnings parity and the employer community and being able to, um, I think these some of these have called higher ed into the conversation, right? Because what we would see sometimes is education saying, well, that's just what employers are paying. Like we don't have any control over occupational segregation. We don't have any control over wage uh, discrimination. and because of some of these components and this data, right, that institutions are now collecting and starting to see, they're starting to say, wait, I can raise some questions maybe I didn't raise before, or I can think about the way that these systems get constructed and how we present candidates to employers or who we partner with for employers. 
we're now seeing campuses say, we're not going to build a program with you anymore because you don't hire our learners. You, you are segregating learners. You've got a demonstrated practice in your hiring. That is a huge um, piece of information. So it, on the there is this demonstrating value and being able to speak to that, but that's also something we're just starting to see in the way institutions are acting and stepping inside these the middle of some of these very systemic and long-standing issues in our um, economy. Well, and what I what I want to add here is it's interesting how there is almost a battle between doing assessment and advocacy. And both of you are talking about how do you translate that assessment data into advocacy positions. So I'm gonna actually move us into that category because I think part of what the fear is, and I know Amber, Leticia, like you talked about, ask you, you know, they have great talking points. There is a pretty clear on the, you know, a one page sheet on how to say, this is the importance of post-secondary value and here's how to communicate it with legislators, with um, alumni, with future students. And so uh, let's talk a little bit about advocacy because Amber, you're also dealing with, with it around um, issues of competency-based education and this struggle uh, with higher ed to get around competency-based as the new way of doing education. So who would like to jump in to talk about advocacy and the importance of advocacy in assessment as well? Do you go ahead, Amber? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I would, I so I'll just share, I mean, even this morning we were on with uh, Virginia Fox's team who has decided we're going to put legislation forward this week, but I'll tell you that every comment, and Leticia, I know you all are in these conversations of like, but everyone's always asking whether it's state leaders or national leaders or federal leaders, where's the data? What do we know about what works? And then how are we setting up systems that, again, allow that innovation to, in our case, innovation to flourish, but responsible innovation. Again, we don't want to do more harm. Our job is about producing something that is more valuable to individuals and where they're trying to go. Um, but data is just so critical to, and to be honest about, that's the other thing, at least we, we feel like because we are committed to responsible innovation, being honest about what we don't know yet and that we still need to figure out. So I'll just share an, an example of, yes, CompC-based education, there's 600 institutions, we're monitoring progress, the outcomes from a wage perspective, from an access perspective, from a completion perspective, through the roof, right? But there's, again, a lot we say to, to legislators, there's still things we don't know, and we wouldn't open the floodgates yet. That's not an appropriate response till we have more time to work on this issue. So again, that is um, a very, again, being honest about where we're shining, what we're doing great, and then using evidence to inform how do we continue to build on that evidence and figure out again, what are the right system level changes that can allow that to, to become more the norm versus what our system's currently producing, which is lots of inequity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I would absolutely echo that. And I think, you know, in my experience uh, in higher ed, um, you know, one of the roles that I did have in the California Community Colleges is a, is a director of student equity. So I was leading our district's um, diversity efforts and, um, and equity efforts and really working in close partnership with um, our research office in, in you know, quite a bit of desegregation of data and monitoring of student outcomes and so forth. And um, part of what came with student equity was really uh, a very generous um, uh, allocation of funding for institutions to, to um, move forward equity efforts that could close achievement gaps. But what I noticed when I when I first took on the role is that um, you know folks were not as used to the, this level of collection of data and really having to um, I really had to work with a lot of program coordinators on discussing the value right I think oftentimes with assessment and I'm, I know I'm probably preaching to the choir you know folks think I have to collect you know I have to do a survey and I have to collect you know, I think sometimes people think of data and assessment as like, I don't know, calculus or, or statistics, and they get really scared. They're like, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to touch it, you know, but 
it's, I think it's more about, you know, build, building that culture of inquiry and just asking those very fundamental questions. Like what is the purpose of the program and how do we know that we're accomplishing the goals of this program? How do we know that our students are learning this? How do we know that our students are feeling a stronger sense of belonging? How do we know this? And you want to know this. This is important. Like, because once you get this data, and hopefully it's very promising, then you can amplify that and share it with the district, share it with the state, secure additional funding, um, and really, you know, even put this program at, at the local, state, national level for other institutions to hopefully learn from it, right? Like, we're in the business of student success. And what we want is to see students cross that finish line, particularly students who come from backgrounds where they would greatly benefit from an, a, a higher education. And so we want to you know, know what works and then share it with the world so other students could benefit from it, right? And so really having those initial conversations, I think, was really key in my role as Director of Student Equity and just again, promoting that culture of inquiry, promoting, um, you know, that, that, that culture of, of, you know, data informed decision making, and then also getting, you know, staff and, and program coordinators and directors curious about the effectiveness of their program. Um, and then really talking about the connection between that and secured funding, and, you know, many other things. And so I think that, um, for me, that that's been, a big part of my role. And then as I moved into a Dean of Students position, again, really continuing to do that and, and working with people and understand staff and understanding why this is so, so important. Under student affairs, we also have, you know, we have psychological services, we have health services, we have, you know, ethnic resource centers, LGBTQIA centers, we have a lot of really critical and sometimes athletics, but really critical services that can be vulnerable um, if we're not collecting um, the data that we need to be collecting and assessing the effectiveness of our programs. And so um, for me, it's just something, again, I'm very passionate about this because I've seen it work. I've also seen how, um, you know, folks can get really intimidated and scared when it comes to data, but really bringing it, you know, to making it much more uh, human and, and, and simplifying it as much as possible, I think has been really instrumental. And so the in partnering with folks like all of you who do assessment is, is so critical. So um, thank you on behalf of all of us who have used your services quite a bit because you've made a huge difference. You really, really have. And, um, and I can't thank you enough for all of us who, who have really greatly benefited from your support. We're going to kind of take this conversation, you know, that, that was the perfect segue, Leticia, because we're going to kind of go in a similar area. What I love that I think we're very clearly, clearly seeing from our presenters is their passion. It's their passion in their local environment, you know, potentially state environments, absolutely in, in national spaces. Some of you may be in local, state, and or national spaces, so we're going to kind of tackle some of that. But the topic we're going to kind of get into here is I love that I'm hearing questions like inquiry and curiosity, but one of the themes we've been hearing and another thing that we can see our, our panels are very passionate about is this idea of equity. We've been hearing the term equity, we've been hearing about the, the importance of the disaggregation of data, but like one of the things Amber said that I really liked, it's not just about disaggregating the data in the local environment, it's like how do we then you know, move that to try to create e equity in our student outcomes after they've even left our institution in terms of hiring. So like when Amber was talking about, you know, the, you know, the, the pay equity in the jobs after I, I was really inspired. Um, and I also like the competency-based education where she talked about the goal is getting everybody to mastery, right? Um, and then, you know, Leticia earlier was talking about, yes, the return on value and how do we really talk about this value and how, you know, it's really important for funding and lots of other reasons that we are thinking through these things and ensuring that everybody's experiencing that value, right? So we're going to get into, um, you know, Mary Jo earlier on said there's some difficult national conversations here. So, um, one of the things that's clear that both of you can do really well is this sort of idea strategic storytelling. You know how to tell the stories to get people curious about data, to get them involved. 
um, and you're doing it at you know local, state, national levels, and that's really important to the work that we do within student affairs assessment and the people who are here. So as you both know, as we all know, equity and inclusion are being challenged in a lot of different spaces. And this is clearly something that you all have um, a deep tie to. So based on your experiences, either you know, at local institutions and national spaces, anywhere in between, what kind of considerations can our campus-based student affairs professionals and whatever roles they may be in, wanna think about in regard to equity and inclusion um, either locally or even nationally? And, and how do we really get people to engage in those conversations and, and see the value of the work from that perspective? And let's start with Amber. I think there's a, well, there's a couple things that come to mind. I often think about where I'm going and what I have to be, what's going to resonate with my audience. And that may be sometimes at, and lately, sometimes that's been folks who maybe are motivated by things that don't motivate me, but understanding how to present them with the data and information that's going to get them on board with what needs to happen for students is what I see my role as. And so um, I'll, I'll just share some states who are not comfortable talking about race are comfortable talking about labor force participation rates because they realize if half their citizens don't have access to post-secondary education, they can't get access to jobs, that's a bad place to be. Or thinking about, um, again, what's going to resonate when I go into a blue state, those are very different conversations. And again, you know, not showing my cards too, too much on where I sit and that, but it, it, you know, again, there's, there's times when I'm like, I don't necessarily agree with this, but I know this is going to get this person on board and I need them to make somebody's life better. And how do I get them to adopt this policy or whatever that I know is going to create change. Um, the thing that I would say from an institutional perspective, again, data, data matters and being able to track not just what's happening, but how do we set, again, it's always what you get, what you measure. How do we start to track those institutional barrier pieces that we need to monitor and understand and being able to understand if we're deconstructing them? Um, because I think a lot of what we have traditionally done in student affairs is talk about best practice. And when we say best practice, we're often saying, well, everybody needs to go to orientation. But what we're not looking at in that is what kind of orientation do different types of learners need? They, and we, we, if we funnel everybody through one way, right, that's what's happening now. We funnel everybody through the same system and are like, why didn't it work out? Well, because people are, again, different and they need different things and that that's an okay thing to, to think about in getting to those more equitable outcomes. So for instance, in a, uh, I'll just again use CBE program, right? We, I talked about everybody gets to mastery. Well, that means there's multiple ways to demonstrate mastery and different learners will take different assessments to get to mastery based on who they are and what they, how they learn. And so again, start to critically think about what those metrics are, um, how they're tied to, again, those systemic barriers that we've long documented exist for students. And again, start to monitor if you're tearing those down, not, you know, certainly with, the, when you're monitoring student outcomes, you'll start to see what those are, but track those progress pieces as well would be um, part of, of my advice. Yeah, that's that's great. Uh, Ticia, ideas to build on that. And I know you hinted at this in your in your response to the previous question, but how might you uh, go a little further? Thank you. Um, so I wrote down a few things because I couldn't agree more with Amber about really keeping in mind who your audience is and what are the what are the institutional values? What is the strategic plan of the institution and how can we tie? The, even the value proposition for assessment um, to that, right? And so some of the things that, that I just jotted down as you were speaking, Amber, is, um, you know, and this comes up quite a bit when it comes to enrollment. I think um, the, the, the conversation around enrollment and the drop, the, the historical drop in enrollment that we're seeing at the national level is, is, is out there and it is so present. I mean, the media has gotten a hold of it and they're constantly reporting on it. And so one of the things that, um, you know, I have been asked in the past uh, as a student affairs uh, uh, leader is, um, you know, what, like what I think about strategic enrollment management. And my response has always been connected to equity work. 
Because in my mind, equity work is enrollment management to a great extent in that when we're talking about building a stronger sense of belonging, when we're talking about really meeting the needs of all of our students, we're talking about increased enrollment and retention. That is going to lead to additional funding. That is going to lead to really um, accomplishing the mission of the institution, which is really to ensure that we are, you know, uh, graduating students who are civically engaged, graduating students who um, represent our college as well. And so all of that is part of equity. Like what we're, you know, folks who are really focused on equity are really focused on ensuring that, that that all students are successful and that again it is absolutely enrollment management i think sometimes when people think enrollment management they think of outreach but they don't think about retention and to me retention is absolutely the same thing and so i think in some cases, really taking the angle of enrollment management as, as a case for equity work, um, but also um, there are institutions who really value civic engagement, who value service learning, who value, um, you know, uh, strong family structures, who value, um, you know, uh, for, for whom there will be people who would like less people to be on public assistance, for, what, for there to be less crime and incarceration. All of these are, are byproducts of a highly educated society. And so maybe some, you know, there may be, we may be in a district or in a state where they don't, you know, race is not, race consciousness is not a priority, but strong family, you know, structures are. And again, Demo maybe democracy is, civic engagement, and all of that is part of really the same thing. We're talking about the same thing. That's what we want for all of our students. And we want equal, equitable access to all of that, right? Um, and so those are some things that came up for me, um, some potential angles uh, that you know we can take to engage folks in, in a culturally appropriate way. When I say culturally appropriate, I mean culturally appropriate for your institution and your district or your state. Yeah, because I think we all have heard you know, the phrase "know your audience." Like we know, like we know that cognitively. But I think what the two of you are really stressing here, which I like so much, was is the practical implications of how prior to having these conversations, yes, you have to think about where are the people you're talking to coming from and what is the message that's going to resonate because probably all of us you're right can tell this story in lots of different ways but yes if we start one way we may not get the traction but what you're saying is find the way that's going to resonate and yeah tying to to workforce tying to strategic planning to the institutions you know mission vision values i, I don't know it, it was glorious uh, mary jo what 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 are your thoughts yeah, and I would add, I think part of it is that student affairs, as I've seen the field grow and move, and even 25 years ago where assessment was really beginning to now, th there is that still focus on butts and seats and what we're producing, but we're not talking about those power skills that we teach um, on the intramural fields when they are serving as referees and learning how to manage conflict between two competing parties. Or um, when we talk about dining in our dining leads and our dining halls, right? Our students are supervising five, 10, 15 other student employees managing schedules. So I think those are often seen as less than, but in reality, that is what employers are asking for. Can they work on a team? Can they navigate complexities of an organization? And so I think it's also about then articulating that value as you all talked about, that these extracurricular activities are actually actually um, lifelong skills that lead to leadership. So we are creating student leaders beyond um, the academic sphere. And I think that's partly as I look at it, and I see especially on a residential campus, I'm working with a variety of campuses right now who are really struggling to deliver that message, but it really is you are contributing to the greater good. And as Amber talked about earlier, you know, career planning is a key part of that. How do you translate those experiences for students, but then how do divisions of student affairs um, communicate that message outside of the division in more effective and powerful ways so that Amber and Leticia in both of their roles nationally can really talk about these very practical and significant gifts that student affairs gives to students. Um, that we don't talk about more broadly. Um, Amber, Leticia, did you want to add to that? 
I, this is my like little soapbox on this. Yes. And stop doing it as individual pro like individual program data is important, but we have to make the justification for what our division collectively does and provides, because if not, we're only serving 10 to 20 learners. What we want to show is how does, again, every learner have, you know, whatever power skills. So thinking about across the division, what are those co-curricular learning outcomes? Maybe you tie those to gen ed, or maybe you tie those to, you know, NACE has their, their skill sets, right? But what you provide is, is that application of skill and indirect evidence of what someone, not just they know, but they can do with what they know. And that, to your point, Mary Jo, is what people are looking at. That's what CBE is, is about not just knowing something, but having the skills and the behaviors to show up and demonstrate that over and over and over to an employer. So do that, but make sure, again, as a division, you understand how cumulatively you're, you're providing that for all your learners. And then the, my other piece is um, get a part of the uh, comprehensive learner record movement or the learning and employment record movement because that's where we're documenting all of those. And as our global society becomes more skills-based, people are going to need that to be able to access jobs, to be able to get into, right? Because employers are shifting to skills-based hiring because they realize they are relying on a system that's produced inequities. But we can meet them where they're at. We still have a very critical role, um, which is why, again, the Value Commission is so important as education providers. But again, we've got to make that collective at scale and be able to provide that transparency to the learner and to where they're headed next for their next whatever it employment, but also their next education provider. Exactly. So um, we are running short on time. Um, this has been an amazing conversation. I, I do want to take a moment, though, and acknowledge what some of our colleagues across the country are experiencing. And um, there is a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of concern. There's a lot of, you know, what do I do now, given some of the enrollment issues that we're facing on our campus? And Alicia, I really appreciate your reframe of that. I also wanna acknowledge there are some significant budget concerns and high political environment. So I'd love for you both to take a minute and think about what message we need to deliver for our student affairs assessment leaders. And I want you to think about how it is that we can move forward in a way knowing that this work is so incredibly valuable and so incredibly important to the future of higher education. So what would you give? Uh, what kind of advice, what kind of inspiration and encouraging words would you give to our colleagues working on campuses right now? Leticia, do you want to start? Sure, I would say, um, you know, and I actually thought about, I, 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 I thought about this quite a bit. Um, and first and foremost, I just want to say that your the work that you do is so critical. You matter so much. And the work that you do matters so much because you have the ability to support institutions, identify, um, you know, disparities, uh, identify um, inequities in student experiences, identify uh, inequities in, in post-secondary you know, um, outcomes, to, to be in a position where you have the technical knowledge and skill set to be able to do that is huge. And so I just want to start by, again, saying thank you and saying that your work matters tremendously. Um, in terms of some words uh, that I would want to share, you know, I think um, if you're ever wondering, like, what can I do? I don't know what to do. I don't know where to start. Uh, you know, my humble recommendations would be, you know, just even um, thinking about how can I help this particular program? How can I help this particular department highlight the value of what they're doing? Um, Again, I think that there's a lot of uh, um, anxiety around assessment, but I think helping uh, program leaders, program directors really um, demystify what assessment is um, and really you know, working with them on, on, on understanding the value of, of assessing their outcomes and that you can be the person to support them and walk them through how you do that, how you might do an evaluation, um, and, and so forth. And so I might, um, I would, I would start there. 
Um, you know, I think that if you can, if you could think about, you know, if you could think small um, and then move from there, I think that that's really big for you to be able to support a program director or a program leader, save a really critical program that is um, really valuable for low-income students, for first-generation students, um, or that can really tell a story about an institutional barrier um, is, is really big and it's really important. So um, I know that the current culture and climate across the nation when it comes to higher education is, is, is a difficult one, but um, make no mistake, what you're doing is critical. Please continue to do it. And, um, and even if you start with something small, small or reaching out to, uh, to a leader or a program director or coordinator to see how can I help, you know, this is what I can do, you know, how can I do that for your program and, and to help you tell your story. That's, um, I would just tack on the um, bless you, bless you, thank you, thank you a million times over. Mainly a couple things is um, that I would just add on is it, it's a hard time to be in, in this industry and just acknowledging that in the same way that every other industry is experiencing a work crisis and employee crisis, higher ed is having its own. Um, half of you don't make what you should make in <laughs> working at an institution with your skill set, with what you're doing, or thinking about again your job loads or things like that. That's because what we're our industry is being reshaped. But what is what is amazing about this moment in time is I I believe you are creating what will be the future of student affairs work, right? When there is such a time of change, I would sometimes I feel like this is the you know the '60s and the 70s when we were, again, providing broader access in a way that we had never done before. We didn't do that very well. It wasn't very, you know, equitable, but we definitely opened our doors to learners we had never served before. We're doing that again. And so that means we're going to shift and we're going to start to have different roles and student affairs will need to look different. Um, I think it's a time to think, again, be curious about what, sh if that's the truth, then, you know, what should student affairs look like? And feel free to to recommend those changes using the evidence you're collecting about the work that is important. This is a great time to create stop doing lists. And that's one of the things I would always walk into that program director and say, you're doing a million things. Let's use assessment to figure out what's most critical. And then we're gonna narrow, we're gonna do those things and we're gonna do those things really, really well. Because otherwise people keep throwing stuff on your plate because they're like, well, we should do this. Well, why do we know we should do that? That's not what my data says. Or that's actually on our campus with our student learner population. That is not the practice that produces results. We should not do that. You want to be able to position and do and have those conversations again, because it will, I think the next 10 years, while there's been a lot of change already, I think the next 10 years are going to be even more transformative to the role of higher education institutions um, in this country and then globally, um, there's so much change happening. So just buckle in, know that you're worth it. You're doing a great job, but also I would encourage you just to step into that change and own that using um, your role to, to create what we need um, to better serve all our learners. Well, hopefully all of you who are participating with us today are feeling as inspired by Amber and Leticia that I am. Um, hopefully you are going to take this inspiration as you go back to your daily roles. But we also have to acknowledge that, you know, our speakers have shared that the experiences we have in our daily roles and in our current environment aren't always positive. So on that note, I am going to invite everybody to our next structured conversation, which is on self-care. So Tuesday, September 12th at 11 a.m. Pacific, 12 p.m. Mountain, 1 p.m. Central and 2 p.m. Eastern, you can join us for another one where you might need a little bit more inspiration as the academic year has started. So as we are concluding this session, I do want to thank um, both Amber and Leticia and the SAL Professional Learning and Development Committee for all of the work in bringing everyone today together today. Um, this has been recorded and we will be sharing the materials. We'll grab the links out of the chat in case you missed them and make sure you have all of that. The recording will also be available on Sal's website. 
and you'll be getting it in email. Now, I know we just heard from Amber, like, what do you take off the list? And Mary Jo, jo throw into chat. You sometimes got to say no to say yes. But if you want to have the impact on this organization, you know, very broadly, Sal is looking for a few open board positions, wonderful volunteer activity that has a widespread impact, um, which can impact both your local environment and the national conversation. So we have we are looking for someone who is a podcast manager. So if you have podcast experience, that would be fabulous. A communication specialist, you know, people good with some TikToks and all of that and whatever all that else. Thank you. And yeah, you can move to the next one. You and then I'll, a secretary. So if you like to be behind the scenes, but you are great at taking notes, this is the job for you. So please consider these roles. Reach out. Um, and you know, connect with us, connect with Sal, and uh, be inspired by this work. And think about how, like our presenters, you can take your work maybe to the next level, not just at your institution, but at advocacy on a broader level. So thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as we all did. And I'm sure that our presenters would welcome you to reach out to them if you have any direct follow-up questions. And thank you again to our presenters not just for being here today, but for all of the work you have done and shared um, and will continue to share during your careers.